uh, administrative uh, capabilities, directories, and so forth, all residing inside that perimeter architecture. And uh, we had a pretty good way of getting in and out. And that, you know, in general, the industry did a good job of defending that that model from a per perimeter perspective. What we saw, though, as devices started to mature and as users got mobility, uh, laptop devices, Wi-Fi started to become more widely adopted. Users felt that they were confined and chained to their desk. Uh, they didn't have the ability to uh, move about, do their jobs, and um, utilize the new devices that were becoming uh, more uh, widely adopted throughout the corporate infrastructure. So probably in the last 10 years, we saw the second shift happen in, in the corporate environment, and that's where uh, mobility started to take hold, and that's what you see on the left side of the diagram here. Uh, from a laptop perspective, from a mobile device perspective, and the way that the industry responded to address this this uh, new change in the architecture shift was to establish VPNs. And VPNs provide a pretty good mechanism for us to allow those devices to now move outside the perimeter. So now they're able to uh, move about uh, and still gain access to things that are inside the perimeter. It's a good security model. It's one that's been proven. It's been, or again, it's been around for 10 plus years now, widely adopted, but it does have some limitations. So that was then, and if we fast forward to where we are today, and uh, this is now and where we see things changing, uh, what's really happened is this fundamental shift in how our uh, users and employees work. Everybody's got multiple devices. Um, myself, I carry you know multiple mobile phones, um, smartphones, uh, iPods, uh, tablets, smartwatches. You can name a, a whole host of different devices. But our users now became enabled with a uh, just a wide breadth of new uh, smart devices that they want to use anytime, anywhere to gain access to not only personal information but also corporate and uh, business assets when they're um, on the go. So what this has really created for us is a struggle around uh, bring your own devices. And, and you know we talk to a lot of customers that say they don't do uh, bring your own devices or they have a BYO policy that pro prohibits um, personal devices being used. But what we see is it, it's, if you look at from an end user perspective, these devices are in our end users' hands. So they have access to them. So how you control that access, again, to corporate assets, corporate applications, how are these devices connected or communicated to inside the corporate network, outside the corporate network, those perimeters that we had enforced before get very hard to um, take these personal devices or these devices that our end users are bringing that aren't necessarily a corporate asset and you know, confining them to that perimeter security model that we've spent the last 20 years developing and, and architecting. So if we look at the shift uh, now if, from an architecture perspective, what we see here now is, you know, we had that, that perimeter network uh, well-defined in the center of our network. We had users uh, over time migrating out to VPN and becoming mobile with a VPN solution. Now we've got this whole host of new devices coming on board that are they're anytime, anywhere, uh, any type of device that's connected both to cloud-based apps and to on-prem assets and apps that are uh, behind the perimeter. The next shift that we started to see is a lot of the resources that were internal are now shifting to the cloud. So things like administration, uh, directory services, email, business critical apps, many of the things that we traditionally had uh, thought would always reside inside that perimeter or inside the secure foundation of the, the corporate environment has now moved out to either web host, web based, or some hybrid solution that again, has moved us away from that traditional perimeter security model that we've depended on for the last, you know, good 20 years or so. So if we look at it from an architecture perspective, we've done a really good job, again, at that perimeter model. We do, you know, uh, the things that have been uh, built and evolved over time, do well defending and protecting the assets that reside inside uh, your perimeter. We've done a good job with VPN and extending the perimeter network outside to uh, devices that can run and utilize VPN software. But where we haven't done a good job yet is how do we defend and protect these devices that are anytime, anywhere, 
gaining uh, access to resources that are both internal, external, and cloud-based. So the real challenge is how do we address and uh, prevent security uh, problems that may exist with these, these new devices that are coming at a, an alarming rate to us. So the way we change uh, our strategy and view of this is we have to shift the perimeter. The old perimeter was really focused on that internal infrastructure. So we focused on the endpoints, we focused on users and servers that were on site. Uh, we focused on um, using traditional appliances and traditional security mechanisms to defend that perimeter. That's no longer the case in that our perimeter has now shifted. We now have to be aware of cloud applications, hybrid cloud, uh, personal devices, vendors and contractors that need to access uh, not only the traditional on-perimeter uh, solutions and, and uh, applications that, that you have protected, but also the cloud applications that you may have available to them now. We've seen the explosion in mobile devices, not only uh, laptops and, and um, smartphones, but you can look beyond that and start to see the, the uh, uprise in smart watches and other smart devices that are going to impact the network and then the move to cloud apps. We see you know, a tremendous shift into more and more applications becoming uh, cloud aware or based on the cloud. So as all this is shifted outside that perimeter, we've got to move the perimeter walls out and redefine where our perimeter lies. So from Duo's perspective, the way that we uh, do this is we've built upon um, Google's Beyond Corp. So Beyond Corp is Google's um, way to address how the perimeter shifted. And what that really does for us is it allows us to um, take a new approach to security. So in a Beyond Corp model, we're going to give no um, trust to anybody. We have to establish trust from a user standpoint during the authentication process. So the way we do that is we want to identify the user. So as users authenticate, we want to use strong passwords, but we also want to use multi-factor authentication. So make the user uh, validate they are who they say they are. Once the user is validated, and we know that we're, we're working with a, a good and legitimate user that's gone through that part of the check, the next thing we want to do is verify the health and security of the device. Is the device up to date? Is it running the latest operating system? Does it have a valid browser version? Uh, plug-in versions, Java versions, et cetera. Once we know that, then we can also look, is the device trusted? Is this a managed device or an unmanaged device? Do I know about this device? Is it BYOD or is it some device that I've never seen before? And I can make decisions on that device based on that security hygiene. If it passes the security checks and it's a device I know and trust, I can let it in. If it's not, I can uh, deny that device from gaining access to applications or resources. And then the last piece is we want to make sure that we provide that same workflow and that same uh, type of security across all applications. So not only uh, cloud-based and web-based, but we also want to do the same thing for internal resources and internal apps. Our users want a consistent experience across everything they access. And for us to get uh, to deliver good security solutions, we need to make sure that they have that consistent experience. If security is difficult for an end user, they're going to find ways to either circumvent it or not use the resources they need. So as you deploy solutions that, that go beyond and change the perimeter, you, you want to make sure that those users have a, uh, a very good flow to um, using the applications, applications, signing in and gaining access to those resources. So Duo does this a couple ways. We can protect cloud apps, we can protect on-prem apps, and we also have the ability to do it with our single sign-on solution. Again, from a, Duo, uh, from a Duo product perspective, our goal is to make the end user experience the same, whether the application's a SaaS-based cloud app, or if it's a on-prem or hosted app, or if it's something as uh, straightforward as a Windows login. We want to make sure that the end user is, uh, experiences a consistent uh, login and a consistent behavior across all those applications. So with that, what I'm going to do next is I will step out of the presentation here and we're going to go and demo uh, some of the capabilities of Duo. And it'll make a lot more sense as to how some of this works and what we do from a Duo perspective. <clears throat> so the first thing that I'll show here uh, is Duo authentication. This is a cloud-based app, so I'm looking at uh, OWA here. 
I'm going to take a typical user authentication process and I'm going to apply the Duo workflow to it. So in this instance here, my user is going to enter primary credentials and Duo is not involved in the primary credential process. So we're going to let that primary credential uh, happen as it does today. So that can be authenticated against Active Directory. It can be a SAML-based cloud resource. It could be LDAP or Radius. We really don't want to be involved in the primary auth. We want to come after primary auth occurs. So primary auth in this case with a good username and a strong password is our first line of defense. After the user signs in and passes primary authentication, the next thing that we see, and this is where Duo is now injected into the workflow, we see what's known as the Duo authentication prompt. And that's this box that you're seeing here. This authentication prompt is customizable. So the logo that you're seeing here, your company logo would replace that. Uh, it's a simple, you uh, replace a graphics file within our admin panel and the prompt will update to show you the correct logo. We challenge the user with multi-factor. In this case here, you can see we give the user a host of options. Um, this particular user has a iPhone registered. They also have a tablet registered, so they have two devices for multi-factor. And then we're also giving them a few other options. We have uh, a phone call and a passcode as, as alternative methods. What I'm gonna show here is our Duo Push. Push is the most popular uh, mechanism we see for second factor authentication. And I'll go ahead and show you how simple this is for a user to receive a push notification to their mobile device. So I click on send a push. You see the push request come into my phone. I see it on the uh, task notification, but I also can unlock the phone here. And I go ahead and unlock my phone. And what you'll see in the push notification here is some contextual information about the authentication. I can see, again, that, that company logo. I can see my username that's authenticating. I can see the location where the auth is coming from. I see a timestamp, and then I have a simple or approve, approve or deny buttons presented to the user. Now, the user, if they choose deny, they can do two things. One, they can send a fraudulent request. So if somebody fished their primary credentials and they see the push notification coming in, they could uh, click on the fraudulent um, push here, and that would notify IT uh, your security administrators via email that a fraudulent attempt has occurred and it would lock the account from a duo perspective. They can also click on it was a mistake. So if they attempted to off and, and don't want to continue the process, they can. But I'll cancel out of that. And I'll show you the push. Um, I'm going to do the simple approve. When I hit approve, you see the green checkbox and users presented into their application. So a very easy, very straightforward auth process. Again, it's frictionless from the end user perspective. Uh, Duo is involved after primary auth. So the user is still going to use the same authentication mechanism they do today. And then once they pass primary auth, then Duo is injected into the workflow. Now, Duo is much more than just multi-factor authentication. And what I'm going to show you next is in this case here, this is what's known as our self-remediation demo. And in this one here, uh, a user, again, is going to attempt to authenticate. They're going to enter their primary credentials. And in this case here, when the Duo authentication prompt loads, what you see at the bottom here is a warning that's telling the user, your browser's out of date. So inside Duo, inside our administration panel, I have a policy set that's checking for browser version and then basing a decision uh, on the, the date and the version that I see. The user is presented with a couple options here. They can still do their send a push, and probably what most users are going to do is ignore that, that banner at the bottom of this uh, push notification, and myself included. That's normally what I do. So I'll send the push to my phone. This time I'm going to approve the push from the lock bar. So I'll go ahead and approve here, enter my PIN, and approve. After I approve, you see the user then is again, again presented with a warning that their browser is out of date. In, in this particular case here, I'm showing Firefox is out of date. I'm 20 days beyond uh, the current version, and I have two options presented to the user. One is to skip, and again, that's probably what I would do in most cases. I would skip and wait till the last day to update my browser, which isn't necessarily the best behavior, but that's what users tend to do. Or I have the other option here to click on the link here to see how to update. And when I click on that link, what it's going to do is take them to the piece of software that's been 
uh, flagged as out of date and then give them the um, instructions from that vendor on how to go about updating that particular piece of offending software. This becomes very, very useful in a BYO environment because if I don't have control of that user, but I want to implement some level of hygiene, I can set these policies. And again, in this particular case here, I'm setting a warning policy that says, you're out of date. Here's how you go remediate. You've got, you know, so many days to get it done. And then if you don't, I'm going to block you from the from access to this app. So the goal here is, especially in BYO environments, is to really change that end user behavior so that they can go out and self-remediate, keep their devices up to date, and then you can build a level of assurance that you know that uh, devices that are accessing uh, corporate critical applications and data, they have a certain level of device hygiene before they can gain access to that, to that app or resource. Now I'm gonna take this same concept and extend it a step further. So in this particular case here, um, this user is going to attempt to log in, and again, the the uh, primary login and the application that I'm logging into is is not what's important. It's again the the process is going to be consistent. It's going to be the user is going to log in the same way they they have to that app. Once they pass primary auth, then they're challenged again with the Duo authentication prompt. In this case here, what you now see is a warning that's telling me I'm not allowed access to this to this particular application because I have software that's out of date. Listed here again is a self remediation link. So I can click on that link and it's going to tell me what is out of date. And I also have the same self remediation uh, link to the vendor on how to download that software and update it. What I like to say about these two examples here is uh, two different types of policies. The first policy was less restrictive. So I could set that policy for an application that I, I don't have say mission critical or business critical data in um, the example I like to use is if, if you want to set a policy for the, the corporate calendar or corporate events you could set a policy for one app that's very lenient in the first case I just warned the user that's that their browser is out of date and I gave them a window to go out and update that browser before I block them in the second example I gave this one here is more restrictive. So in this case, I'm saying your browser is out of date. I don't want you accessing this app. And where I would tend to say that you'll see uh, a more restrictive policy like this is where the data or the application that a user is attempting to access is more critical. The example I like to give is Salesforce. If your users are attempting to log into Salesforce, especially from a BYOD uh, machine, or they're off visiting relatives over the holidays here, they sit down in a machine, they know the URL of the application they want to log into. I can force device hygiene and check that device during the login process to uh, either block or approve that device as a, as a known or trusted uh, device based on its hygiene level. So if you, sit, if you plan on going home for the holidays, you sit down at grandma's PC, uh, she's running Windows 95 on her PC, and you attempt to log into a you know, business critical app, Duo can block you from gaining access or your users gaining access to that resource based on on the hygiene checks that it does from a operating system uh, browser and plugin version level all right now i'll move even further because duo can extend beyond that and in this case here i'm going to take uh, another approach at this again i'm logging into an app this one happens to be uh, outlook web access again i'm going to go through primary credentials when I sign in through primary credentials this time, what you're gonna see here is I'm getting blocked and it's saying uh, you're not allowed because you're not using a corporate device. In other words, you have a personal device. This particular app has a policy that's restricting personal devices. And if I click on the remediation link here, we give the user a little verbiage that lets them know that administrators have set up a policy that only allows corporate managed devices to gain access to this particular application. So from a duo perspective, you can see, it, you know, if we go back to that, how our networks have shifted to the perimeter now outside the corporate environment where we've got all these devices, we have the ability to not only add multi-factor authentication into the workflow, but now we can start to add policy-based controls that check the device hygiene, that check whether a device is managed or not managed um, before we gain access to an app. 
The beauty of this is, is the policy engine and the policy controls are on a per app basis. So the example I gave before, where you want to have, uh, you know, the corporate calendar uh, not be super restrictive. You want users to be able to access that from pretty much any device. You're not too concerned about the hygiene because the data on it is not sensitive or confidential. You can have a policy for that particular act application that's relatively lenient. And then for your more critical applications, such as a Salesforce or a Workday um, or internal applications that you may be hosting, you can create a policy that's much more restrictive on those, not only forcing you know, multi-factor authentication, uh, but device hygiene, and then ultimately checking whether or not that device is a, a managed or known device versus an unknown BYOD device and make a policy decision based on that. One thing worth pointing out here, um, during this process, when a user attempts to authenticate here, and I'll just refresh my demo, after they enter primary credentials, uh, this authentication prompt that's presented by Duo is very key. And the authentication prompt is how we gather the information during the auth process. So from Duo's perspective, we don't run an agent. So anything that you need to protect, is an, it's an agentless model where during the auth process, we will gather this information as the user authenticates, and then we'll make the policy decision based on how the administrators set up policies for um, either at the global level, application level, or at a group level. And because of that, uh, again, we do it through this agentless method because uh, we have that capability to, one, do it through agentless, and then two, build those granular policy controls uh, we can get real detailed on who can access what apps from what devices and what locations. Now, I'm going to shift gears here, and what I'll do next is I'm going to step over into uh, the Duo admin panel just to show you some of the information that we gather during that auth process. And once I get in here, I have to multi factor into our admin panel. So once I approve, I'm in. When I step into the Duo admin panel here, the, the things that I'll highlight from a Duo perspective, again, um, as the users are authenticating in to our uh, protected applications, we're gonna start to gather information about those devices. So I'm looking at our device insight tab here, and what you're gonna see, we're gonna start to build some, some data around who's authenticating, what type of devices they're using, are they trusted or not? And then uh, graph those, that information out. So in this example here, you can see I have a, roughly about 230 devices that are authenticating to the different apps I have protected. 59% uh, of those devices that are uh, offing in are laptops and desktops. 41% of them are mobile. And I'm showing right now I'm about 64% out of date compared to the latest releases that are available uh, from the different uh, software vendors that. Um, I'm looking at. If I scroll down here, uh, you can start to see some time-based charts over what does my device hygiene look like uh, from a historical standpoint. So in this case here, I'm looking at an operating system. When I see the Sawtooth charts here, what this tells me is something uh, updated here. So if I click around this time frame right here, I'm guessing that uh, probably iOS or Mac updated uh, software. Here it is. iOS 11 released on this day. So the day after it released, you see most of my users didn't update. Um, and then over time, as users uh, and new updates come out, you'll see the salt tooth curve flatten out as user behavior changes. The, the nice thing here is this gives me this real high level snapshot where I can come in, I can look at operating systems, I can look at browsers, and I can look at plugins and make a real quick uh, you know, determination, what, what do my users do from a device perspective when updates come out? Are they updating? How long does it take them to update? Uh, are they practicing good hygiene, especially in the BYO space? You know, what are they doing uh, to their devices as these releases come out? Now, if I take that same information, and I can dig a little deeper into it here, uh, if I click on mobile devices, in this case here, I'm gonna do a breakdown of the information I'm gathering from mobile devices. And again, we're doing this in an agentless fashion. Uh, on a mobile device, there will be the typically the Duo mobile clients installed. 
Um, it's not an agent in a, it doesn't run in the background. It's not something that consumes resources. It's there to accept push notifications and approve the push. And then during that push notification process, that's when I'll interrogate the device, grab the information around what I'm seeing from the auth process and uh, put it into the duo admin panel here. In this case, you'll see I have iOS devices authenticating. I have Android devices authenticating. You'll see the breakdown of the different versions. Uh, in this case here, um, you can see I have 126 uh, iOS 8.1 and I'll come back to that in a minute. If I scroll down, I can also tell if devices are jailbroken or rooted. I can tell if screen locks enabled or disabled, and then uh, biometrics as well. So if I wanna make sure that uh, my users are using biometrics on their mobile devices, I can tell if they um, have it turned on or not. And then lastly, in the case of Android, I can tell if it's uh, encrypted or not, if they have encryption turned on. I'll scroll back up here and I'll just click on this iOS 8.1 to give you an example of what we can do inside the admin panel. When I click on that, you'll see a bunch of radio buttons pop up on the left, and this is where I can now start to filter uh, real detailed information about the authentications and the information that I'm gathering during that auth process. So you see I have iOS 8.1 checked here. That's what my filter is looking at now, and if I look at the logs here, I can see uh, the device phone number uh, in this particular case because it's mobile. I can see the platform version I can tell the model version of the device, uh, the duo version that's installed. I can also tell those other um, things that we're looking for. So biometrics turned on, screen lock enabled. Um, in the case of if it was uh, Android, I could tell if the disk was encrypted. And then lastly, I'll see the user's authentication name. All this information, again, I can filter this however you like. So um, again, with the radio buttons over here, I can filter down and get some real detailed lists. Uh, this information is all exportable from here, so I can pull this all out into a CSV file. Um, it is also available via our APIs, so if you do want to pull this information out and push it into a SIM, a SIM of your choice, uh, we do have some direct SIM integrations as well as an API toolkit that allows you to pull this information out and then ingest it into the SIM of your choice. And the last piece that I'll touch on here before I um, show you two other features in here, and then we'll open it up to Q&A. Uh, from a duo perspective, all this information here is, is good. This is you know, where I start to build information about my devices, but where this information starts to get powerful is when I apply it to a policy. So policies will come in three flavors. There's a global policy, which applies to everyone and every app. There's application policies, which will be specific to an application that you're protecting. So that application could be uh, O365, it could be Workday, it could be Salesforce. Um, it would be dependent of the application that you're protecting. And then lastly, there's a group policy. So if I had groups or uh, wanted to group users together for common uh, use cases, I could build groups and also have a group policy. Policies get nested together, so by combining global application and group policies, I can get a real granular uh, level of control for different users and different apps. So just know that you know the policies are, depending on how you nest them, you'll get different outcomes based on uh, the, the results you're trying to achieve. Let's take a look at the global policy here so you can see some of the things that we can do, uh, what a lot of our users gravitate gravitate towards and what they like in, in that, if we go back to that model of, of the shifting network of this new perimeter model, uh, some of the things that our users like to set up from a policy perspective that help them to uh, define the new perimeter. So the first one I'll show is user location. So when a user is authenticating here, I can set uh, policies based on the location of that user. So if I wanted to block uh, North Korea right now from gaining access to an app, I could set that country's origin and then deny access to a, uh, again, I can do it globally, application, or at the group level. So in this case here, I set uh, North Korea to deny access. I set um, Russia to deny access. And then I'm going to say all other countries require 2FA. And what that'll do for me is, depending on the geolocation of the auth attempt, I will then force the particular um, requirements for either allowing users or denying users based on the, their geolocation. 
scrolling down here, uh, the next one that we see is trusted endpoints. So this is the this is the you know the ultimate for Duo in the achieving that that Google Beyond Corp model. What this is, and this is part of the demo where I showed that uh, you can establish trust to known devices. This is where I would set a policy that says I'm only going to allow endpoints that I I know are trusted, or I'm going to allow all endpoints. So if you have a very sensitive app and you only want corporate managed devices to gain access, this is where I would set that policy with trusted endpoints. Next one here is remember devices. This one here is a, an ease of use for our end users. Uh, we use this one here at Duo. We set an eight hour uh, once per day process for multi-factor authentication. So what this does is uh, I have a multitude of cloud-based apps that I uh, gain access to as well as on-prem apps. I do my multi-factor once uh, when I come in in the morning and then I'm good for eight hours. So every application that I click on from our single sign-on portal, I don't have to do a multi-factor push all day long. It's just uh, once and done in the morning. Now every application link that I check on during the day or I click on and attempt to run, uh, the policy engine is checked. So if I would change to a new device or I would change something with my authentication, I would be prompted to, to multi-factor again. But if I'm stationary at the same device all day and I off once in the morning, I'm good for eight hours and, and I don't have to um, multi-factor through the rest of the day. We talked about operating systems, browsers, and plugins from a policy perspective. This is where I set them. So if I wanted to block, you know, uh, say I didn't want Chrome gaining access to a particular app because I thought there was a security or I was concerned there's a security flaw within Chrome, I can set a policy to block certain browsers. And this is where I can also set my warnings or blocks if uh, browsers are out of date or not up to the current version. And again, we have that ability with operating system, browsers, and plugins to set the version controls and either block or warn based on what we see. If we scroll down a few more options here that customers like, uh, authorized networks is a good one. Uh, authorized networks is if I have a network that I know and trust. So in my case, I'm sitting at the Austin office here today at Duo. If I want to use that um, multi-factor on, on that network, I can set the policy that basically says, if I'm on that network, don't challenge me for multi-factor authentication. Uh, trust that network and don't prompt me. So it's a good, again, it's all about making the, the user's uh, authentication process easy. So if I know and trust that network, I can set the policies so they don't need to multi-factor from that, that trusted network or networks. I also have the reverse of that. So if I have a network that I know I don't trust, so in the case of, uh, I like to use the example of a guest network, if my users uh, for some reason decide to log into the guest network today at the corporate office, um, I'm going to force them to do 2FA because it's an, a network I don't necessarily trust. I know it's open to the public. Anybody can get on it. So in that case, I want to make sure it's a little more secure. So if I see the auth coming from that particular network range, I will require 2FA in that case. And then the last piece that I'll show here, uh, and, and this one is really around the authenticator side. So this is how you um, are doing your second factor authentication. And this is where I can establish the methods for, again, it's either global app or group based. So in this case here, if I want to turn off SMS at the global level, because NIST is deprecated uh, SMS as a method for second factor authentication, I can simply uncheck this box and SMS will no longer be an option presented to the users for multi-factor authentication. Now, the good thing, again, because we can do these group levels uh, or different levels of, of um, policies, we can do it at the application level, the global level, or the group level. We can create exceptions. So if you, you know, usually what happens for me is I run across that group of users that doesn't have a smartphone that can only use SMS. We can create a very defined or narrow window of, of users that can gain access to SMS, and then everybody else we can block. So again, the, the benefit here is based on the security posture of the particular application, you can allow or, or deny the different authentication methods that you want uh, based on your security posture. A Duo mobile app, we can force the app to be up to date. So if, if the uh, push app is not up to date on the mobile phone, we can block that user from authenticating. So they'll be forced to go out and refresh their app and stay current on Duo. 
tampered devices, if a device is jailbroken or rooted, uh, we can block that device from providing the, the auth during the, the process. So we'll check it uh, as the user attempts to do their uh, second factor authentication. Screen lock. If the device is not screen locked or have a screen, has a screen locked enabled, we can block the device from gaining access. Full disk encryption, in the case of Android, if the device does not have encryption turned on, we can block that device again. And then the last one here is biometrics. So we can force uh, either Touch ID, um, Face ID, or uh, Android fingerprint um, in, in the auth process. So again, because it's per app, per global, or per group, we can set a, this biometric requirement so that if I have an app that's really sensitive, I'm gonna make the user uh, use their biometric during the authentication process. So when I send that push, not only will you have to pass all the other criteria I have defined in the policies, but then you're going to need to uh, verify your push with a biometric uh, based into that device. That's it from the policy perspective. The last thing I'll touch on here, and then we can open it up to Q&A, is just from a reporting perspective. I mentioned this a little bit earlier. Um, so reporting for us, uh, you saw the custom filters for device insight. There's also authentication logs here. Duo being a SaaS-based service, um, we keep the logs indefinitely, so the information's there. You can set, if you want to purge logs, you can, but uh, by default, we keep logs forever. Um, and we're going to track a couple different logs in here. We're going to have authentication logs, so you're going to see when users are authenticating, uh, whether they were approved or denied, the applications are gaining access to, and then what factor they used for um, gaining access. We also have administrator action logs, so we can see what the administrators are doing um, and track the users uh, or administrators and make sure that they're, um, when they're logging in, what they're changing and so forth. We also have an authentication summary, so if we wanna see you know, how many users are, or just overall what our authentication success rates look like, uh, how many offs we're receiving a day. Uh, we, can, we chart that out nicely here uh, in the authentication summary. And then the last one here is deployment progress. So as we roll Duo out, we're able to track you know, how, how well the uptake is for Duo. Uh, we have the ability through our policy engine to set sort of a, a phased in approach for Duo. So it's you can think of it as an optional multi-factor. So the policy can be set so that if I'm in Duo, if I'm a registered user in Duo, I'll get challenged for 2FA. If I haven't set my account up inside Duo yet, it'll bypass 2FA and it'll bypass the security checks. And this deployment progress uh, log, log here allows us to see exactly what's happening. So how many users we have, how many apps we're protecting, who's actually using it and who's not using it. And then we can actually see uh, users that haven't authenticated so we can go out and remind those users they need to set up their duo account and uh, protect their assets so that they can gain access to, to certain apps so with that that's everything that i have to cover i'd like to open it up to q a next um, i'm happy to show you know more features and functions within the admin panel from duo i can show more on the workflow side if you want to see uh, additional things from the workflow perspective um, not only how the user uses duo but how they may set up duo and so forth i'm happy to do that as well so i will at this point i'll open it up to uh, q a all right thank you very much scott appreciate that very informative presentation Joe, I didn't see any uh, questions come in on the chat. I don't know if you've seen any either. Just confirm. Yep, I'm looking now. I uh, don't see anything on the chat, but we will be following up with all the attendees to see if they have any questions, uh, maybe questions that are more contained to their specific organization. So we will follow up with everyone from there. And if no one has any questions, this will be the conclusion of the webinar. So thank you, everyone, for taking your time again to come and listen to Scott present on Duo. And we hope everyone has a great week. Thanks, everyone. All right. All right. Take care, Scott. Thank you very much again. Thanks. Bye now.